Um, I think, can we back that up just one? I just want to share something real quick. Um, these are things I just happened to take over the years and pitch pictures, so I wanted to go through them with you. This is, I believe it was Harding that was here. Um, this was The Passion. You remember when we went to see The Passion? Uh, and um, Paul Wilson, are you here? There you are, Paul. I want you to notice up here. There you are. Did you see yourself? Okay, Paul Wilson was in there. He said he didn't think he had made that. Just lovely people over the years that we've seen and we've been with and and, and that was at the passion of the grove. And there again, I have so many more on my home computer, but I'd already put it up, and so I'm missing a lot. But friends and loved ones that we've that have been here. Whoa, we're going quick. Can we back it up a little bit? Did you get all that? I think we went. If, so, what did you say? Weaved out? Okay. That's not Kim's fault. This is lovely technology. We're not going to do that in my lesson, right? <laughs> okay, I, I think that one's done. Oh. Three runs. This is the part to show they really were there. There we go. Keep, next one. Phil Pierce. Remember Phil Pierce? Joe and Kenny, who is now preaching the gospel. Jennifer, there's a group. I snuck in the ladies' class and took a picture. That was our first year at Waswag. And I had a few of Waswag in there. I don't know who that guy is. <laughs> Don Davis. My mother in law. There's Fred and the boys. That was our youth group. Don actually took that, but it was in my computer, so. I'll give you a copy of this later. I believe that was the second <coughs> time to watch White. our prayer warriors, folks. Other warriors. This was the first gold wear uh, after we had grown some. And then the next one, this is our, about two weeks ago, our ladies uh, at gold wear. This was after the uh, they remodeled everything about three weeks ago, something like that. When we were first studying for our small groups. That's at the Barlow's, I believe, another small group. Eating. Yeah. That was a hunter safety class at this church. Can you believe that? Then we did that. There's Ron Owen up in the corner that taught that class. And he came in today during our class. Ah, teens. <laughs> I think that was one of the lockdowns, Bob Rowland teaching the class in the auditorium. Gabe Gibbs. Darlene, of course. Charles Lee. Now another man. 
Look at those two up in the top corner. They got kids, same group. I think he's about to walk her there, but she could have won. She would have won, I trust him. She would have. Our kids. Special singing here at Max Center. Andy Griffith, Sunday nights. You remember that? We had a Bible study dealing with whatever the topic was. And I could hear Ma laugh all the way through the whole... Jim Rhodes giving us some words of wisdom. <coughs> Albert Lemons, forever indebted. That's our historic committee. It's our 100 year anniversary and there they are. And we miss a lot of them. That's it. I had so many more on our I, uh, when I first, I was asked to come and speak here years ago in the early 90s, and I came and I spoke, and I told a joke, and I just happened to find that just, and it had Max Center written, and this is the early 90s, and in that, uh, that time that I was asked to come and speak, I told this story. I said, um, there was a young man who came, I was younger then, uh, there was a young man who came, and he spoke, he was, he was going to take the place of the minister who was there. And uh, he was trying to liken himself as a substitute for the minister that was there. He was looking around the small church building and he saw a cardboard in place of the, the, the glass. And so he likened his substitution as the cardboard in place of the glass. And when, when the sermon was finished, he made his way to the back. And as the people were coming out, one elderly lady walked up to him, shook his hand, kissed him on the cheek, and she said, son, you were not a cardboard today. You were a real pain. So I just happened to come across that as I was going through my, my stuff, coming my office out. You know, I was going to begin this lesson going through some of us and what we've heard and how we've met and, and things we've been through and, and start naming some names. And I thought I can't do that because I'll miss someone. And every one of you are so important like everyone else that we've come in contact with and with, we should. We cherish so many of those things. And so I thought what I would do is I started looking back and I thought of the, the funerals, so many funerals that, uh, I want to say victorious funerals, uh, that we preached uh, together. And then we've said goodbye to people that we just honor so much. Uh, so many examples to us, encouragements to us. Uh, and uh, we've done that together. And we've married a lot of people, haven't we? Uh, a lot of couples have come together. We saw two of them that were up there that uh, have kids of their own now. And, uh, and then I thought of baby dedications. A lot of baby dedications. And not so many up here as in your homes. Uh, parents and grandparents uh, that were there as a part of that. And we come to this time that it's almost time to go. And friendships are friendships that run deep. When you have an invested interest with those people that you're saying goodbye to, and you and Debbie and I have invested our lives together for several years. And I like that as the best investment that we've ever made. And in life, you find yourself asking some questions that I presented to you a while back, and it was, is this cost effective? Is this time effective? As I've gotten older, I come to the point that I ask, is this life effective? And I can say gladly and cheerfully, it has been all three for this congregation. It's been good for my family to be here. And the ministries that you and I have involved ourselves with have been very good ministries. They've been ministries that the rest of my life, I'll look back and say, it was good that I was there. It was good that we partnered in these ministries. And I've got to say, I've got my ladies uh, here at Go Where. I've lost my ladies because Wayne Dittmore now, they're treating him better than they <laughs> I'm, only, I'm only kidding. But we did go. Uh, we went to Go Where the other night. They gave us just a, a lovely dinner. Uh, about 30 people were there, something like that. Just uh, they gave me a beautiful Bible. Um, but the hugs and the loves of this group right here are just, just amazing. And Wayne and Ginger are going to be 
uh, going. And the reason I mention that is because I walked in and there's Wayne. And the next thing I know, four of them have Wayne and they're walking over to their seat. And I go, hey, it's my night. <laughs> this, but I don't know. Oh, okay. And Carmen, it's good to see you. She hasn't been here in a long time. Uh, but all of these ladies, right? I won't go through all of them. They're lovely people. But the reason I mention Goldware, I, I really have to say this. About nine years, this is the church within the church. And I'm going to share this. Within nine years, uh, and by the way, we did marry one couple from Goldware. This is, and, and for the, you, you guys have heard me say this, Goldware is a senior living, it's an apartment resort is what it is. It's the prettiest place I've ever seen. It's the most loving people that I've ever met. And at the same time, unity, by, unity within diversity is what I would say. People from various backgrounds, we've come together, we started this as a peak of the week kind of type of thing, coming together, realizing that we all have different backgrounds, but we love the Lord. And what we have in common, or what we have in common as this group, is we have said, it is not if I'm right, we have come together and we said, you know what, we want to love each other, and we want to study together from the one word of God, and we're not going to let things that are different, maybe that we kind of see different. We're not going to let that get in our way. We're just going to open our Bible every week and we're just going to look at God's Word because it's the one solid that we have all across Christendom everywhere is God's Word. Meg, I see you back there. I see Donna back there. Raise your hand. They're back there too. So they're kind of scattered throughout here. And so keep praying for this group. And, and the last thing I want to say to this group is the way they take care of each other. Call each other first thing in the morning. Call each other last night thing at night, making sure that they uh, everything's okay and they love each other. Now, what do I preach on my last lesson? I started one thing, I started something else, and I thought, this isn't even hard. Why I love this church. And that's the title of my lesson. I love this church. Well, I, I couldn't put why because I sold somebody else's picture. So, why I believe, why I love this church. And I'm not going to coddle you. These are things that I believe in the depth of my soul of why I love this church. And first of all, I love this church because I believe that this group of people, these saints, these Christians, these people that call themselves Christians, disciples and followers, I believe that you are truth seekers. And I would have a hard time being at a group of people that I invest my life in and my wife's life in if they were not truth seekers. Not afraid to ask the questions, why do we do it this way? We've always done it that way, but I want to know why we do it this way. And some things we've said, we're going to change that. We've always done it this way, but things change. We want to look at the way we're doing it. Let's get back to the Word. Let's look at that again. If the Word has given us some liberty, let's use that. If it doesn't give us liberty in this area, let's hold firm. But we're truth seekers. And if anything in our past has gotten in the way of bringing people to the Lord, we'll not stand for that. Because we're truth seekers. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We are Jesus seekers. We want to know what he thinks. We want to know what he says. Our loyalty is Christ and his word foremost. And our, our goal is not to follow the ways of the past or the way that is popular today. We want to be led by the Spirit of God. We love this church because this church wants to be led by the Spirit of God. And it says we will be checked by his word. Desires to follow the teaching. John chapter 8 says, And to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold my teachings, if you hold my teachings, you are really my disciples. And then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Who's the truth? He is the way, the truth, and the light. But you can't separate what he says from who he is. And you can't add to it, you can't take it away. We understand freedom is a freedom not to be enslaved to sin. John chapter 8, Jesus said, Verily, I, very truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now, a, a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. 
And this church has come to a place that realizes that the word is a lamp to our feet. You remember the illustration of the old carbide light that my uncle and I would use as we would go raccoon hunting out in the woods. And, and we understand the word is a lamp to our feet. And, and we don't have to see way out there. We see where we're at. We don't have to see way off in the future. We just know he'll take care of that. And so we see where we are. And we realize if his lamp, if his word is not a lamp, our feet and it's not lit and we'll be in the darkness with the rest of the world as it was at the time of Christ. We've been set free. And we're set free to follow His way and His will and we're free to be at liberty where He's given us liberty. Not to be bound by just traditions. Some traditions are different than other traditions. Traditions of our Ancestries is one thing. Tradition is the Holy Spirit laid out at the time of Christ is another. Not to be bound by our traditions to keep people at bay from coming to the cross. Galatians 5, 5, which is the thesis of the book, basically, it is for freedom. Can you hear Patrick Henry screaming this? It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. And so there, there's this wrestling with this freedom. But I think this church, it's got it. At least it's stepped into it and starting to really grasp that. It's, it's not the seeking to do as we please. Because that's the dominion and the foundation of Satan's realm, is it not? But a freedom to follow him and... And not to be separated from him by sin. No, we're free from the law of sin and death. Where if I sin, if I, if I make a mistake and I'm studying and I'm striving, I'm not kicked out. I'm not, I don't fall out of his hand. I fall in his hand, but he continues to carry me. We're free from the law of sin and death. And in this journey that we take, if we confess our sins... You don't let any of them anchor you down. You don't let them hold you down. You don't worry about it. You forget what's in the past. You just move forward. And we thrive and we encourage one another on these kind of scriptures. Romans chapter 8. Therefore there is now, therefore there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Because Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus the law of the Spirit who gives life is set you free from the law of sin and death. Let's go to the next one. John, 1 John chapter 1. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just. Forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And the awesome thing is that we look for these cues because we want to share this good news with others. This church does that. I receive stories all the time, either, either on my telephone or somebody in person, and they don't want to say it publicly for some reason out here. They don't want to look like they're being uh, prideful. And so they take me aside and say, I want, to, I want to share with you something that happened this week. I shared, I shared the gospel with somebody. I shared my faith with someone over here. I was at a doctor's office and I shared it here. I was on a bus and I shared it here. One of my coworkers, somebody told me recently at a school that they were at, Someone was down and they shared their faith. You know it's for the whole world. 1 John chapter 2. My dear children, I write this to you that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous one. He's the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also the sins of the whole world. But we're human. And sometimes we want to lag behind when God's trying to take us forward. And other times we run ahead of Him when we we're supposed to wait upon the Lord. But we are dedicated to being where God wants to be. So the first point is, this church, I believe, with all of my heart and my love for this church, and Debbie and I, we've discussed the fact that, where are we going to go?
This is just a polling area. This is a, a praying church. Magnolia Center is a church that believes that prayer works. Now, there's a lot of churches that pray, and I'm not putting any of those churches down. Please, it's kind of like when I, when I went to, to have an interview for the police department years ago, and they asked me, they said, okay, we've got, you know, there's 40 people out there. Why are you better than them? Lee, you remember that question? Yeah. Norman? <laughs> Why are you better? Why are you better than those people? Why should you get the job? And my answer was, I don't know about those people. But I'll tell you what I've got to offer for this job. I don't know about the praying part of the other churches. But I do know about this one. This is a group of people that prays constantly. On any given Sunday, and I've seen this change over the years. On any given Sunday, you look around, stop in the middle of your conversation, look around. You're going to see somebody over here. You're going to see somebody back there. Their eyes are closed. Their arms are around each other. They're in prayer. I'm down the hallway. I look down the hallway and I'll see two people holding hands. And they're in prayer. We believe and we realize that prayer is our lifeline to God. And we understand that God is a father. And kids want to talk to their dads. And there's times that respectfully you're asking direction from a father. And when they're hurting to curl up with their parents. When they're afraid to go climb into bed with their parents at night just because they're scared and need to help. That's prayer. And you don't hear us say, I'll pray for you. Well, you may hear that, but it's only after someone says, hey, come here a minute. And they pull you off into the side room over here into the back, or last week in the back where you see different people, and they put their arm around them. And they say, hey, let's just pray right now. And if you don't see it here, on any given week, on any given week, on the telephone, are going to be people in there talking, and instead of saying, hey, I'm going to pray for you, they'll say, hey, can we pray right now? Folks, don't ever stop that. That's the power of this church. You're talking to somebody, and they're hurting. I've never been turned down. Do you know that? I don't think you have either. Say, can we pray right now on the phone? On any given week, we also have our prayer warriors. Jay Shackerford. Calvin May, both of them are leading prayers. Groups of people coming together and praying for names that have been turned in. And not only that, for those of you that haven't been there, they write all across the board, all across that board, anybody they can think of. And we, we bow down and go around that room and everybody praying. And some people, it took them an hour or longer to get here just to pray. And they did it. Calvin driving halfway across L.A. to get here with that big crane just in time so that he can pray with those that come together. And we get our cue from Jesus because he taught us how to pray. Can you do it with me? Can you put the next slide up? Will you say it with me? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Sisters. 
I would know if they were daughters of God that came to, that came to this earth. Or are they just my sisters that I love very deeply? James knew Jesus. What's he say? This is the Lord. As a matter of fact, he says, let me tell you how to pray. Chapter 5 says, therefore confess your sins one to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. And Elijah was a human being. He's talking to us, folks. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain. It did not rain on the land for three and a half years. He prayed again. The heavens gave rain and the earth produced its crops. I wanted to read more, but for lack of time, I had to cut that short as read that. But let's jump to the next one, the third one. We have four, and the last one's very short. We love this church because this is a humble church. The one thing that really stands out to me about our servicemen and Kellens, and we did a great job as one of those servicemen that helped protect our country along with others over here. Thank you, Kellen, for a wonderful job. Um, Kel has seen some of the worst of the worst, and we thank him very deeply uh, for all he's doing, and, and he wants to be very active at this church, so let's just keep encouraging him. Uh, our servicemen, though, let, let me hold off on that. I'm going I'm to push that to the end, okay, just for a reason. As I mentioned earlier, God, God has a remedy for our sins. And guess what? For any time that you start to feel pious, you start to feel like you're a little better than somebody else. God has a remedy for our sins, and it ain't you. <laughs> it's not me. It's not us. It wasn't anything that we did, and this church recognizes that. We understand we're saved by grace through faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that God sent him here. Can I, can I stop just quickly to say, if you want your faith to get stronger, simplify everything. I mean, Debbie and I have simplified a lot of stuff lately. We have gone through so many things. We have thrown things out, things I've had for years. I thought, you know, I just can't haul this. And it's very humbling to lift up that tomorrow they're going to be coming in and pulling our stuff out of storage. When you shut that storage bin and you look at it, you go, that's it? 59 years old and this is my life. And you start to realize, no, that is not my life. I'm not defined by anything in there. If, if that were blown away or if it burned up, I'm okay. We're okay. That's not, we're not defined by that. And as we start to look at our Christian walk and what God has done, all of us, He may have used us and thank God that He used us and we're so appreciative that, that He accepts us and that He's accepting of us and He's accepting of our service. And the joy of our life is, is service to help others to simplify and show them the gospel of Christ. And we understand, as this church, we understand more than anyone else our own weaknesses. And we realize that we're fellow citizens and not any one of us is better than any other one of us. And our ministry with each other is very encouraging and strengthening. And no one prays God, we're here by grace. Ephesians chapter 2. He says, Consequently, you're no longer foreigners and strangers. You're fellow citizens with God's people and also members of His household. That's who we are. And we're built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets and Christ Jesus Himself as the chief cornerstone. And in Him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in Him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by His Spirit. And I've got to add to this before we jump to that last part quickly. And that faith that you have. If there's anything that I have studied with more probably in this area, this, this is it. We realize we've got to be vigilant in our faith and we've got to share our faith, but we've got to remain strong in our faith. And if you're toying with something that you shouldn't be toying with, if you're teetering on something that you think, well, I'll wait till later. I know, I know I'm living outside of the Lord with this, but... But later, I'll worry about it later. There are stern warnings about that, but sometimes people also toy with this and then they wonder later when they're really going to repent. Can I repent? Please, God, give me that option. We're going to hit this very quickly. We have to keep our eye on Him. 
Satan's number one goal is to get you to think that you are most important. His number one goal, and that was the goal in the Garden of Eden, was to say, you know what? You do what you want. Don't worry about God. Live as you want to live. Don't worry about God. Worship yourself and what you want to do. Don't worry about God. That's the only strength Satan has. That's all he wants you to do. And so we come to this place at Magnolia Center where we look after one another. Because Hebrews chapter 6 says, it is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the power of the coming age, who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance to their loss. They are crucifying the Son of God all over again, subjecting Him to public disgrace. Some people believe that maybe this means that they have sinned so much after becoming a Christian, they can't be brought back. Folks, if you're worried about it and you're wanting to repent, you're wanting to follow God, this doesn't even apply to you. But you're at a point of repentance. Repentance takes place in the heart of the person. This doesn't take place in the heart of God. It takes place in your heart. It doesn't say that God won't bring you back. And we've all known people that get to that stage that they say, you know what, I, I, I just can't go back. I just, or you've seen people that can't be drawn back. And that's what's the fear of this passage. But we're going to go in quickly here. Um, this church... We're a, we're a humble church, but we recognize what we've got to be careful of. But we don't judge one another. We encourage one another. We use the word to show if we go astray why we should be brought back. But we take our cue from Christ. We don't care where you are, where you've been. We care where you are. And we care where we're going together. And finally, this I promised you a very brief last point. Very brief. This is a compassionate church. I love our soldiers. Our servicemen, I should say, and women. I love what they've done for us, but I love their creed that they will leave no one behind. And many a serviceman has been wounded carrying someone else from the battlefield into back into safety when they were safe. Paul Wilson's one of my heroes. He knows that. How many people get out of a burning airplane that crash landed and gets out of it and realizes his men are inside and puts his own safety at risk and goes inside and just gets burned tremendously. Paul thinks that bothers some of his doesn't. I don't even, even notice it until I realize what a hero he is. He went back inside and brought his people out. Compassion. People that won't leave people behind. Folks, I hate to say it, but I've seen some churches that are less compassionate to the brothers and sisters. But this church won't do that. This church doesn't leave anybody behind. And we don't say, if you don't like it, go somewhere else. We just say, hey, you know, we'll grow together. And hopefully we're also not saying, you know what? Whether you like it or not, this is where I'm staying. It goes back to that truth seeker thing. We encourage one another. First Thessalonians chapter 5. Therefore encourage one another to build each other up just as in fact you are doing. And now we ask brothers and sisters to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, who admonish you, hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work and live in peace with each other. We urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive or encourage the disheartened, dis disheartened and help the weak and be patient with everyone. I'm going to end with this. These are some of the things that fit in a sermon. That we love this, why we love this church. But you're not just a church, you're individuals. We've been in your homes, we've been in our homes, we've been through so much together. My desire is that you look at the time we've been together with grand emotions. But my real desire is an anticipation for who's coming. I, I just can't wait to find in the Lord's sin. And this will be a time of excitement. And my, my prayer, my prayer is that whoever comes here and they're in this pulpit and they're leading and they're loving and, and there's someone that loves people and they love the Lord foremost and they love His Word and, and they're not afraid to go wherever Christ sends them. They're not afraid to step out and look at the word a little different than maybe you've seen it because something has blinded us. 
And then we all look at the word together very open with it. And my deepest desire is that your very best days in Max Center, that in Missouri I'm going to hear about. And you're going to be calling me. You're going to say, you're not going to believe this. And this is the, the greatest days of Mag Center. You're not going to hurt my feelings. I'm going to be thrilled. I'm going to ask you to pray. Father, you're a great God. Father, this is a church that loves you. This is a church that believes so strongly in you. We believe it. We leave everything aside when we come together to worship you in word and song and heart and spirit. And Father, I pray that the greatest day for this group of people, this body, this, this body of yours, this, this group of saints that in the very near future, they won't want to go home. It'll be like the days of Hezekiah when they'll be coming together to worship for a week, saying, can we do this another week? Father, I pray that you put the fire of your spirit in every person here to burn. They look for every opportunity to share your word with other people. And they'll hurt with other people and rejoice with other. Father, whoever takes this pulpit, whoever preaches from this pulpit, whoever leads in that capacity, Father, I pray that he will be a man who cares nothing about the wealth of this world, that he will be someone who will be in their homes day and night in prayer. And that he will truly be a friend of yours first and a friend of everyone's here, here and next. I thank you for the love this church has shown my family and I. For the leadership of this church. For all those who have been praying. And the congregation says together, in Jesus' name, amen. If you would like us to pray with you, John, I'm really, I'm really sorry. If you would encourage to say that several times. Have, if you would love us to pray with you, like to do that, that's what we're known for. We're praying church. If you would like to be baptized in Christ, that baptistry is waiting for a wonderful opportunity to be buried in Christ and rise up again. A new person, everything you've done in the past, washed away and you walk on from here to the Lord Jesus. We can help you in any way. Please come. Stand and sit.